This unit covers networks forensics and within it we will try and understand some of the methodologies that we use to to analyse network traces. We try and develop an in-depth understanding of some of the key network protocols including IP, TCP, ARP, ICMP, DNS and some application layer protocols and then also define a range of audit sources that we can analyse to see network activity. The core of most network traffic, especially traffic that goes to and from a host, is based around Ethernet, IP and TCP. And normally when we abstract the way that data is sent, we, we look at it in a layered model. This makes it easier to analyse simpler to abstract at different levels and also makes the inter interconnection of protocols and equipment easier. So we normally start with the original data then we add some application layer protocol onto it so this can include HTTP, FTP, Telnet, SN, SNMTP and so on and it's this type of information that tends to be used to be able to interpret the data in the correct way. Then below that we have the transport layer and the main objective of the transport layer is to segment the data and to rebuild it back up into the original data source. At this level we get a, a connection between two entities. Then below that we have the network layer and the network layer is there to ensure that we can get delivery of data packets as they leave one host and arrive at the other. Then we need to encapsulate the this network layer or data packet in some format so we typically add a header and a trailer onto it and wrap it with inside a data frame. So the most popular data frame is an Ethernet data frame and this represents the data link layer. Then we transmit it using layer 1. Often when we view the traffic on a network we view in different levels of abstraction. So we could look at the local network traffic with inside the Ethernet layer, the data as it's transmitted across the internet within the IP layer, the data that's transmitted between two application programs and the TCP layer and so on. The core of most communications on the internet is built around the client-server three-way handshake. With this initially a host connects to a server. The first TCP segment which is sent has a SYN flag set. Then the server, if it's willing to accept the connection, will send back a SYN acknowledge. If this is acceptable, the host will send back an acknowledge and the connection is bound after this. The key parameters involved are the ports, the TCP ports on either end. A key element of the TCP protocol is that it's connection orientated and it is also reliable. And the reason that it is reliable is that it uses a series of sequence numbers and acknowledgements. So in this case we can see we have sequence number 1 sequence number 0 followed by sequence number 1 and so on. Over here we have sequence 1, sequence 0 followed by sequence 1. The acknowledgement is sent back from one machine to the other to see the next data segment that it expects to see. So in this case the server sends back to the client that it expects to see sequence number 1 and it is in this way that the server acknowledges that it's received the data to the client. So
So once we have the handshaking, then we can transmit data. So we can see in the example here, then when the data is transmitted, the server, the host in this case, acknowledges that it's received up to byte 27 and expects to see 28 as the next sequence. As we can see here, the next part of the sequence is 28. At the same time, the server acknowledges that it's received the previous data segment. So in this way, the client and the server can act in a reliable way. Another part of this negotiation is the window negotiation. With a window, we negotiate the number of data segments that are allowed to be transmitted before one side has to wait for acknowledgement from the other. So in this case, the host says that it's willing to receive 8,192 data segments before it will wait for uh, an acknowledgement. So let's have a look at the main elements of Ethernet, IP and TCP. So with TCP, we have what's called the... With Ether Ethernet, we have what's called the preamble. And basically that's just a series of ones and zeros. So we have eight bytes of this, followed by another byte, which defines the start of the Ethernet frame. Next, we have the source and destination physical addresses, and these are six bytes long. And the true strength of Ethernet is that it can carry many different types of layer 3 protocols. So if we have hexadecimal 800, which is 1000, zero, 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 and then eight zeros, then it identifies that the next thing that's coming with inside the data is an IP data frame. If it's 806 hex, then it's ARP, and so on. So Ethernet can carry a number of layer 3 protocols with inside itself. Then at the end we have a checksum. For the IP header, we have the version number. So typically this will be version 4, which looks like this, or it might be version 6, which looks much different. Then we have a type of service, the identification, time to live, and the protocol field. And it's the protocol field which will define what layer 4 protocol is coming next. So if this is a 6, then it's TCP. If it's a 1, then it's ICMP. After this, we have the two 32-bit source, IP, and destination addresses. The TCP field, the main two parts of it are the ports, the TCP source port and destination port, and we can also see the 32-bit sequence and acknowledgement numbers. With inside here, we see the flags such as SYN, ACK, FIN, push, reset, and so on. This contains the window here. So let's look at an amazing little protocol called ARP. And it's ARP that possibly makes the internet so dynamic in that we can actually connect a computer to the internet and it can be discovered by all of the other hosts on the internet. And it's ARP that does the resolution of the last part of the network connection and often shows traces of initial connections to a network. So what does ARP really do? Well, it would be extremely difficult for us to be able to find out what the actual physical address of a remote computer actually was because to be able to communicate with 
uh, another computer we need both its logical address which is its IP address and also its physical address so if we wanted to communicate with a computer on another network then it would be almost impossible to find out what its MAC address actually was so what we do is that we use its logical address to be able to get the data packet transmitted across the internet and then the last part of the connection and also the first part we use the ARP protocol to be able to discover what the MAC address actually is of the destination so in this way a host here can find out the gateway and communicate with it and then routers in between can then route the data packet based on its logical address until it gets to the last part of the connection and then it is up to ARP to be able to resolve this last part and to be able to produce the final delivery of the data. So in this case we have a node here at 75.1 and it wants to communicate with something out with the network. So the first thing it must do if it's just uh, connected to a network is that it must discover the MAC address of the gateway port in this case the gateway port of the router this is at 75.132 so if it hasn't discovered the MAC address of the default gateway it sends out an ARP request broadcast to the whole of the local network and this is bounded by a router so routers do not send the ARP broadcast over to other ports Oh, the computers listen and if they hear their IP address so in this case the gateway will then the gateway port sends back a directed reply back to the host if we use a switch then no other computers on the network actually hear the reply if you use a hub then all the other nodes will hear it so then the node adds this to its ARP cache so it, it doesn't have to rebroadcast it for a certain amount of time when it has this it can then communicate with the with the, the, the default gateway port MAC address and with the IP address of the destination so then we go through the whole of the internet changing the MAC addresses of the local router ports until we get to the last router the last router then will do a broadcast for the, I, the destination IP address and then it should be able to resolve the MAC address and deliver the, the actual data so let's see this how it occurs so in this case we see the ARP being broadcast to the network so in this case we can see the source is the local MAC address of the computer and we use the broadcast address which is all ones and this is the broadcast here then the ARP reply comes back such as this and we can see now there is no broadcast it comes from this MAC address here and sent directly to this MAC address here. The first part of uh, a MAC address uh, typically identifies the manufacturer so in this case it's a VMware adapter and we can see here that the reply says this is my address and this is what my MAC address actually is. Okay so that's an ARP reply so we can have a look at this so we, we normally find that before some form of activity there is an ARP request to be able to resolve the addresses so let's have a look at this in Wireshark so here is our ARP request so in this case we're requesting the the target address in this case we're asking for 75.2 and we'll tell us who 
as we're at 132 and then here is the reply coming back again to actually define the MAC address Another key element that we have with insight our network traces is the trace of a SYN flag with inside the TCP packet and this often shows the star of uh, client server communications. So to recall again what we basically have is that a client wants to connect to a server. The server waits on a certain port, TCP port so the client sends a SYN on the port it wants to use to the server port. If the server accepts it, then it sends back a SYNAC to the client and then the client sends back an ACK and this is defined as the three-way handshake. So here is the trace. So you can see here that this is the source sending to the destination on TCP from its own local port which in this case has been identified as 3655 which has been given a name there and that gets connected to the FTP port with a SYN, a SYN flag so we he see here that uh, the sequence number is set so the reply comes from 132 back to .1 and comes from the FTP port back to the 3655 port with a SYNAC and in this way the server is saying that it now expects to see data segment 1 next. After this we actually see data segment 1 coming from the client and we see an ACK coming from the client to the server so this shows the three-way handshake. So if we have a look at one of our traces. So this shows uh, an example of SYN, SYNAC and ACK. So in this case we're connecting to the Telnet port. So just have a look at that in Wireshark. So our connection happens Telnet, we have SYN, SYNAC and ACK. So we can look at the detail of this. So here are our flags. Okay, so there's the SYN flag set. We then have a SYNAC, SYN and an ACK. And then we have an ACK. And these two addresses plus the two TCP ports should be unique across the whole of the internet at that given time. So now let's look at an example of an application protocol. And the one thing to remember about many of these application protocols is that they were developed at a time when we had a simple terminal which connected to a mainframe. So many of the commands were actually typed in manually and then a response came back. So application protocols such as FTP, HTTP have all grown up from this original teletype model. So we'll see a lot of commands that look as if they've been typed in. So with FTP uh, we connect to port 21 so after we've connected we can then use one of our commands. So the commands include ASCII, binary, by, change directory, get and so on. When we send these we get a response which is a numeric response that comes back. So codes that have 
the term between 100 and 199 our request action has been taken has been taken 200 codes mean that the action has been successful and and so on so examples are 200 means that the command is okay uh, 202 the command not implemented and so on user logged in is 230 a password required is is one of the 200 codes entering passive mode is 227 so an example interchange so once we connect we'll see the 220 message coming back to say that it's now ready so the first command that we can send is as we define the user so now we need a, well it's actually a 300 code 331 code defines that a password is required feed in the password and if it's successful then we get a 230 code which is that the user has logged in syst will show what operating system we're using so in this case it's Windows NT PWT shows the present working directory which is the top level in this case and then many FTP systems use passive FTP with passive FTP we can actually see what the 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 server IP address is and as we'll see also which port it's going to open up for the communication so port 21 the connection port is only used for the commands and responses when data is to be transmitted the in passive FTP the server sets up a, a port to connect to the client then connects into it so the list is useful for getting a list of the, the folder change working directory allows us to change the current directory and so on we can set ASCII and binary here and this is an example of us transferring a file to the, the FTP server so we can see here we have our commands and then we have our responses with passive FTP we obviously have our, our commands and responses in the same way but we if we need uh, to make a listing or get data to be transferred then we go into a passive FTP mode so in this case the string that comes back is important because it defines the IP address that we need to connect to and also the port number so in this case we have 4 and 23 so the calculation is made such as this so it's 4 times 2 5 6 plus 23 gives us port 1047 so then the client will make a connection on to that port with a syn, synac and then an ac and the port's created here and the data can be transferred after which we get the normal finac at the end of it and we should see a uh, transfer complete so let's have a look at an example of this and we'll look at our FTP trace okay so here is all our commands that we would normally have and then we have our passive and we can see here that a port has been open up, opened up here so we'll have a look at this within Wireshark so here's the passive mode coming back so it's 4 and 22 so we can see that in this case the port that's opened up is 1046 so that should be 4 times 256 plus 22 the port that our local machine is used is 3656 which differs from the 
the other TCP connection which is 3655. So this shows an example of the data being transferred. So this is the connection being set up here and the data is transmitted and then we see the reply the connection being closed here okay so we can see other examples of the data being transmitted a protocol that can be used to discover the host that connected to network or the routes that they that the data takes is ICMP. With ICMP we have a fairly simple protocol which is carried uh, with inside an IP packet. So in this case what we have is that we have a request an ICMP request type 8 which is an echo echo request as a certain sequence number so that we can match up the reply when it comes back and the data we typically see is E, B, C, D and so on so when a occurs an ICMP 8 echo request goes out and then we get a zero echo reply and again as we said the sequence number matches up that if we can match up the sequence number we measure the time it takes between sending and receiving we can measure the, the latency between the, the two machines. Ok, so let's have a look at an example of some ICMP. This shows an example of a trace. So we can see here this is an, exa is an example of the ping payloads. So we'll just have a look at this uh, within Wireshark. Okay, so here we are, and we can see we're using Ethernet and IP. So we have a type 8, which is a ping request, and then the data itself is just the sequence that we identified earlier. This is the ABCD, and so on. And then we have a, a reply. So in this case it's a zero and we can identify the sequence number that's coming back again. See the next one is a sequence 18, 19 and so on. So this allows the the actual requester to match the replies as they come back. What we have here is hexadecimal representation of the ASCII characters. So 61 in hexadecimal is 01100001 which represents a lowercase a. Another protocol which shows the st normally the start of some form of trace of activity is DNS which is used to map a domain name into an IP address. So the way that it works is that uh, a local machine wants to access a destination and all the machine actually knows is, is what its domain name is. So this domain name has very little uh, has very little relevance to the internet and especially for the intermediate devices so we must resolve this into a destination IP address so it's DNS which is used to resolve this domain name into an IP address so the way that it works is that uh, we have the domain which is responsible for, for mapping the domain name into uh, an address and within side this there is an A record 
to find for the domain name which will resolve the IP address. We can also have a CNAM and a CNAM defines the different aliases for the domain. So in this case our host requests from a local DNS with a query as one of the flags of the DNS request. The op code is zero. It asks for a recursive lookup and recursive means that if the local DNS doesn't know the the resolution of the domain name to the IP address it will go and search higher level domain servers and it also asks for non no non-authenticated servers and the query is tell me what the IP address is of Intel the reply that comes back is then uh, has the flag of reply standard of a standard query defines whether it was a cursive lookup and it will give the IP address that it's found and the server it found it from so let's have a look at an example of this So here we have our, our DNS lookup. So port 53 is the destination port which is used. So we can see here communication going back and forward between the DNS server and the client. Okay, so here is our first request, DNS. It uses UDP and the destination port is port 53. So here is the query. So I can see here that uh, the flags that are set, that it's a response, and the message is a query, and the other fields that we have include the opcode and whether it's it's re recursive. The reply that comes back looks something like this. So this is the, the response here, because the uh, the flag is set to a one. And then we then see what the query was, and then what the answers are, and eventually we can resolve the IP addresses. So in this case, there are two possible addresses that we can use for our response when we connect. So try again. Oops, our connection isn't isn't there just now. But the response that we would get uh, relates to ninety two one two two one two six one seven six. One area that we might see malicious activity is with uh, port scan. So. There are tools which can be used to scan a, a, a network and it is our task to be able to detect this type of malicious activity. So Nmap and HPing are tools which can be used to assess any vulnerabilities in this respect. So you can see here there is a host at 75.1 and there is a destination of 75.132. So in this case, uh, the this host is scanning this host uh, initially on port 23 Telnet, and then on the next port, which is 256, and so on. So this is the type of signature that we would see if someone was port scanning a, a host. The main types of scan that we get is a, a TCP scan. With TCP scan, there is a, a full SYN, SYNAC, ACK, then a FINAC, so the connection is actually closed. So this is often the case where uh, the application has been written at a high level and doesn't use a raw socket. We can have a SYN scan, and a SYN scan is where the 
the intruder sends a sin, but the connection is never actually made. So this results in half open connections. And often this is the case where the application has been written with raw sockets. Often the SYN flag is blocked by a firewall. So an intruder might use a FIN scan because a FIN will, is allowed to go through a firewall. And with this closed port, often respond with a reset flag, but open ports ignore it. So we can see here an example of a port scan, which is scanning on random looking ports 81433, which relates to SQL, and, and so on. We can also have a port sweep, and with a port sweep, a certain port is chosen, in this case it's the web port, port 80, and then a number of hosts on the network are then scanned for this open port. So this is often where the intruder is looking for a vulnerability in the, the infrastructure. So we can use uh, Wireshark to be able to detect the, the presence of this type of activity. So we can see here that uh, in this scan there is a great deal of traffic related to different types of protocols. We can see here there are only four packets related to each one and that uh, there is there is no traffic actually carried on on each of these over here we can see a great deal of sin activity and resets coming back and again over here we can see the basic trace of sin so if we have a look at an example here So we'll have a look at uh, this one. You can see here there is the trace of a sin on port 80. So let's see if we can find an Nmap one. It takes a little minute to, to load it. So this, there's a great deal of SYN activity down here. So it's port all eights, then 23, 256, 993, and, and so on. So we can have a look at that within Wireshark. And I see there's a great deal of SYN activity. So this often shows malicious and intent and we possibly want to, to detect it. A sin flood can be another sign of malicious activity where multiple sins come in from uh, an intruder's machine. So in this case we can see here that uh, we have a HTTP connection and we have the continual request for HTTP so with this we we can get a denial of service if an intruder continually tries to access on a certain port or we can have a distributed denial of service where there are many hosts distributed across a, a network. An intruder will often try to cover their tracks, so we must be wary of spoofed MAC addresses and spoofed IP addresses. So in this case, an intruder sits at 192.168.75, but has spoofed his IP addresses to look as if they come from 10.0.0.1. So it the IP protocol itself does not have any integrated authentication of the actual IP address of the machine. The same goes for a MAC address. It, uh, 
it is often fairly easy for an intruder to be able to spoof this, this address and send Ethernet frames from another node. Something else that we might uh, need to investigate is the usage of application protocols. So application protocols are typically built around uh, a request and a response. So in this case we have the, this is the a sample of the HTTP request that a browser might send when it's accessing the default home page of a web server. So you can see there is a great deal of information with inside this request. So such as the the operating system that's used, the, the type of browser, even the host IP address along with the supported content types. The reply that comes back is often a message, a response code, so in this case 200 says it's OK and then we see other things that are sent to be able to define the date and and where the content is. After this we see the the actual content, the data being transmitted. So we can see here this header gets stripped off and what we have left is this content which in this case is the is the web page. So if we have a look at an example connection here. So we can see here here's the Syn Synac ACK. So the local source port is 2427 on port 80. So then the, the requester asks for the default home page. We see the a response coming back after which we then get multiple data packets with the actual content. So if we have a look at this in Wireshark. Okay, so we see our Syn, Synac, ACK, and then this is the client asking the server for the home page, and then we then see the data being transmitted for, for this connection. So we can see that there are multiple segments that are sent, so it is up to the client to be able to build these back into the original data. Sometimes we can get multiple TCP connections set up. HTTP itself was meant to be a, a fairly lightweight protocol where the connection was closed after the trans transmission was finished but often there's a keep alive signal that's, that's, that keeps the connection open. An example of an auditing tool that can be used to detect when files have been changed is Tripwire. So with Tripwire we we have an agent program which will watch certain folders or certain files as to when they change. These then get stored in some form of audit log and we can set up events such as sending an email or an SMS message whenever something has actually changed. So let's have a look at a sample of this. Okay, so let's have a look at Tripwire, the configuration of Tripwire. Tripwire is useful when we want to detect when files have been changed on a system. So the main files that we have here are tw.pol and that defines the policy of Tripwire. So we have a, a text copy of it. Let's have a look at this. Uh, obviously this file wouldn't be viewable on, on the system and is normally deleted, but in our case we can have a look at it. Okay, so this defines the rules that Tripwire will use to actually monitor files. So we'll just use an editor to edit this file. And we use 
this G edit and we've got it already stored there as a recent file so the rules which have a hash in front of them are ones that have been commented out so these are standard rules the trip one would normally look at such as watching the files in the S bin and the bin and security bin are binaries that should not change and these should be read only and then we see the, some of the boot files the lib folder again these are binaries that shouldn't change and what we'll do is we'll, we'll modify the password file in, in the etc folder and these are configuration files that shouldn't change so we've commented out quite a few here anything that happens in this, the etc folder will be monitored and then down here are any changes to these directories home temp user var and var temp should also be monitored okay so we'll keep it as it is and what we do first is we take the, the text file and then create it as our pol file which is an encrypted file with our policy so in this case we're taking our text file we have some encryption keys stored and then we're compiling it into our policy file tw.config and we need to put the the super user password in here so we can see here that we now have tw.pol next thing that we do is that we create our database this takes a little minute to do this while it's doing this we can have a look at oh, that's fine ok so it's now got our database and what we'll do is that we'll go and change one of our files, so let's say we change the ownership of the password file to Napier and let's see if we can find another folder which is monitored somewhere so let's go to slash temp So we can see what we've done is we've changed the ownership of the password file and also of the temp folder. So what we'll do is we'll run tripwire again to actually check. Oops, wrong font. Just takes a little minute to check against the database and check all the files. So we've we've stripped out quite a few files from it and we can see here it's told us that we've modified the slash temp and we've also modified the slash password file ok so our error report defines that uh, we have one invariant directory and we also have a change in one of the security control files. This defines the level of severity. Normally 100 is, is defined for boot files and data binary files. And this is a, is a level 66 here. As we can see from our configuration file. Sixty 
six. This is a medium criticality, crit, crit, criticality, and a hundred is significant points of vulnerability. Okay, so we can also have traces of activity on, on a machine that relates to network traffic. And if we have a Windows machine, there are certain folders that are set up that will monitor and keep a history of, of various activities. So in the recent folder, we see uh, any recent files that have been created. Within cookies, we get uh, a store of the cookies. So if a web page is accessed, if it has a cookie, then it will save it in the cookies folder. We can see uh, Internet Explorer history within inside this folder and also this one. And there are various other ones such as the start menu and documents and so on. These are reserved as special folders. So we have a look at our toolkit. So we can actually look at uh, the previous history of, of URLs. Okay, and this is stored with inside the, the URL history folder. There are a number of special folders that we might look at uh, in terms of an investigation. So we can have the recent folders, can look at the cookies. So in this case there's quite a few cookies in here. So it just takes a while to, to scan the folder. Then we can have application data, desktop, favorites, history, the internet cache, documents, pictures and, and so on. There can also be hidden folders on a, on a system. So you can see in this case there is a hidden file here. So when we do a normal listing, the file not might not appear, uh, but uh, only when we do a search for hidden folders and files do, do we actually see them. And you can look at the file rights for each of our files and folders. Okay, so that, that concludes the presentation. So hopefully it's given you an understanding of some of the methodologies that we might use in investigating uh, network traffic, a deeper understanding of some of the key protocols, such as IP, TCP, ARP, ICMP, DNS, and a few application-led protocols. And we've also investigated some basic audit sources to determine network activity.